Hello. All right. We are in module 12 and we are actually going to be starting with the notes videos in the middle of module 12. So I apologize to those of you who are not in my physical class, but we took some notes in class that have led us up to page 394. On page 394, you can read about ideal gases. You don't actually have to copy these word for word into your notes. However, I'm going to tell you what is important. Okay. Um, let's read them through together though. First, the molecules or atoms that make up the gas are very small compared to the total volume available to the gas. In other words, there's enough, there's a lot of room in the container that is um, housing this gas and the molecules themselves are tiny within that container. Number two, the molecules or atoms that make up the gas must be so far apart from one another that there's no attraction or repulsion between them. So again, in order for those molecules not to be attracted or repelled from one another, they have to have plenty of room to spread apart. So again, that means large volume, right? And then third, the collisions that occur between the gas molecules or atoms must be elastic. In other words, when the molecules or atoms collide, no energy can be lost in the collision. Also, no energy can be lost when the molecules or atoms of the gas collide with the walls of the container. So the energy that those gas molecules have, they are keeping their energy. They're not losing it with a lot of collisions against each other or against the container. Now, let's take some notes on what we need to know, okay? Ideal gases. Okay, ideal gases, they are ideal in large volumes and if we have a large enough volume remember as volume increases that would mean that you would have low pressure and high temperature so in order for gases to, to behave as ideal they are in a container with a large volume, there is low pressure and higher temperature. All right, they are ideal when near or higher than 273 Kelvin, which is equal to zero degrees Celsius. Okay, so to give us some sort of number to compare it to, because when we say, okay, it needs to be a high temperature for it to be ideal, how high are we talking? This is how high we're talking. The high temperature must be near or higher than 273 degrees or Kelvin and then zero degrees Celsius. And then again, when we say it has to have low pressure, how low are we talking? Gases are ideal when near or lower than 1.00 atmospheres. And that's how you tell if a gas is ideal. And we call this standard temperature and pressure. All right, STP is the abbreviation for standard temperature and pressure and it means a temperature of 273 Kelvin and it means a pressure of 1.00 atmospheres. So if in the problem you are told that the gas is at st standard temperature and pressure it would mean that it's at 273 Kelvin and uh, 1.00 atmospheres and then it will behave ideally and then you can apply all of the equations that are, you are using in this module. So the important part about having an ideal gas at standard temperature and pressure is that all of these equations then work. If gases are not behaving ideally then you don't use these equations. All right, now we're gonna move on to another equation. There are a lot of equations in this module. This one is called Dalton's Law 
Dalton's Law of Partial, wow, my whiteboard, pressures. And it is when two or more ideal gases are mixed together, the total pressure of the mixture. So when two or more ideal gases are mixed together, the total pressure of the mixture the total pressure of the mixture is equal to the sum of the pressures of each individual gas is equal to the sum of the pressures of each individual gas. So we can write it like this, PT, which would mean the total pressure. I'll write that down here. Sorry, we're getting real close to the bottom. Total pressure, PT, equals P1 plus P2 plus P3 and so on for however many gases you are adding together. P1 plus P2 plus P3 dot dot dot. All right, and these are the partial pressures. Oh, my son is being so noisy upstairs even though I told him to be quiet. I'm sorry if you can hear talking in the background. Partial pressures of each gas. Okay, so that is the equation for Dalton's law of partial pressures. Let me erase this. And I feel like the green is not showing up very well, so we're going to switch to a different color. So that hopefully you can see it well. to something a little darker. We'll go back to blue. Okay, so in learning about Dalton's law of partial pressures, there's another truth that can be learned. The pressure of an ideal gas, oh dear, this is still wet. There. The pressure of an Ideal. This is not working, is it? Okay, hopefully you can see that well enough. The pressure of an ideal gas. Ah, oh, it's still light. Maybe it's my marker. Okay, let's we'll switch to a black. Does not. Oh, brother, that's not working either. This is not my day for markers. Aha, there we go. The pressure of an ideal gas does not depend on its identity only on the quantity of the gas. All right, so when you are mixing two different types of gases together, let's say you're mixing oxygen gas and nitrogen gas and you mix them together, just because they are different types of gases, they're not going to mix together and oxygen's not gonna apply more pressure than nitrogen because it is oxygen, okay? So it does not depend on the identity of the gas. Um, the gases all exert the same pressure only depending on how much there was of it. Does that make sense? 
okay? So just because it's oxygen doesn't mean it's going to exert a different amount of energy or pressure against the nitrogen. It just depends on how much oxygen is present. The quantity of each gas determines how much pressure, not the identity. Okay, now going on to a new thing. This is vapor pressure. Vapor pressure. This is the pressure exerted the pressure exerted by the vapor which sits above a liquid. Okay? That is the vapor pressure. So for example, think of a glass of water. Okay, I have a glass of water here. Now if I was to leave this glass of water out for several days, say, um, the water would eventually, probably more than several days, the water would eventually evaporate. So what does that tell us? That tells us that the tiny molecules of water here are very slowly gaining enough energy to escape out of the liquid form and evaporate and become the gas form of water and then um, disperse within our atmosphere. So sitting above the liquid water here is actually a layer of, in this case, water vapor. So the pressure exerted by the vapor which sits above a liquid. So above this liquid we have pressure exerted by some water molecules in the gas form. That's the vapor pressure of water. Now, vapor pressure increases with increasing temperature. If I was to increase the temperature of this water, it would evaporate more quickly because the water molecules would be able to would be able to gain more energy from the increased temperature and then with more energy they would be able to leave the liquid form and escape into the gas form so as you increase temperature the vapor pressure also increases because there's more vapor sitting on top of the liquid as more of those molecules are able to escape Okay, on page 397 is table 12.1. See table 12.1. In table 12.1, we see the different vapor pressures of water. And you can see how as temperature increases, the vapor pressure increases for water. So you're going to want to refer to this table for some of the problems in this module. And then of course on the test, you will be given these different values as you need them for the problems on the test. So let's try one and see how knowing the vapor pressure